<clears throat> Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, continuing our study of the book of Jeremiah. And if you're following along, we're going to begin this study in chapter 10. Um, and you remember that in the eyes of the nation of Israel, Jeremiah was a nobody. He was not an important figure in the overall scheme of things. He was just a young guy, and yet in his relationship with God, he, he is righteous. He is right with God, and God is going to use him. And so God tells Jeremiah, go down to the gate at the temple. And as all the people come in, as they're going into worship uh, and bring offerings, um, uh, you know, understand that the people who were receiving this declaration of judgment by, uh, by God through Jeremiah, these are people that who are not, you know, in crack houses or, or bars or something like that. But rather, this declaration of judgment is being delivered to people who are going to services, going to church, going to temple. And so here in chapter 10, this sermon from Jeremiah is a declaration of judgment to the nation of Israel, which he started several chapters earlier. And Jeremiah is talking about the foolishness of idolatry, the nonsensicalness uh, of, of idolatry. You know, you cut down a tree, you carve an image, you cover the image with gold or other precious metal uh, or jewels. And because after all, this is a God, a small g God, and you want it to look fantastic. And so as Jeremiah is finishing his sermon, um, this is what he has to say. <clears throat> All right, so um, if you don't have your Bibles, I'll put a, a link to the verses. <clears throat> but press pause now and read verses 1 through 8. 1 through 8. And then press play again. That reference in verse 8 of senseless and foolish uh, that could also be known as being stupid. This is referring to a trunk of a tree that is, uh, you know, the part you cut down to, to uh, carve out an image uh, that could be referenced as, uh, you know, a fillet of the tree. And what God is saying here is that the trunk of the tree used for, to carve an idol is worthless. Understand that there are many things that Jeremiah's, in Jeremiah's world that were different in our world today and one of those things which was different was in jeremiah's culture everybody believed in some kind of a god an idol god um, or believed in many gods atheism is relatively a new concept in um, in, the, in the history of man it's only been around for a few hundred years but prior to that whoever you were and wherever you lived around the globe you would also, uh, you would always surround yourselves uh, in the community with one form of a God or another. And so Jeremiah is telling them here that you're all worshiping these worthless gods. This sounds very strange to us. How can a person cut a tree down, take part of it, carve an image of a God, and part of the other tree is used to heat your house or cook your food? And they're worshiping this carved image as a god. Very strange to you and me. But understand that everyone in Jeremiah's uh, history time was doing this very thing and claiming at the same time to be a, a be religious people. All right, so let's uh, press pause and read verses 9 and 10 and then press play again. And so the entire world came uh, face to face with the one uh, will come to, fa uh, to face to face with the one true God. And it's not going to be anything like what they are experiencing with these wooden idols. All right, press pause, read verse 11, and then press play again. And so these gods do not have the ability to create. God is attempting to get these people to understand that you... The people who have created these gods, um, 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 you're the ones that created them. You know, over the next several verses, God is talking about his creative genius. He's saying, I created this, I created that, I created you. 
And then almost like God is addressing the entire uh, city of Jerusalem. All right, press pause now and read verses 12 through 18. 12 through 18, then press play again. The Lord is saying to Israel, okay, you can create these gods, you can create them, but have you ever stopped to, to, to consider who created you? God is saying, I created you, and then you, by your own hands, created these other gods. Now, it's like God saying, I'm two generations better than your idol gods. These gods have not created anything at all, and due to the fact that uh, there was an unwillingness of Jerusalem to acknowledge the real God. God has uh, cr uh, created me. Then again, we find this prophecy uh, that God is going to allow the Babylonians to come down out of the north and completely trash the southern kingdom of uh, Judah, <coughs> the southern kingdom of Israel, going to completely destroy Jerusalem. And the verse says, I'm going to sling them out. The people will fly out of the city. Notice now in verse 19, we have Jeremiah's response to all of this. So read verse 19, then press play again. Notice that Jeremiah is not happy. He's not filled with glee. You know, can you imagine how many of these people heading into the arms of judgment that he probably knew personally? Many of them were family members. Many of them he went to school with. And remember, he was being trained for the priesthood. Uh, he trained for many years with many of these people. And now, uh, you know, again, we spoke of this over the past few weeks. Jeremiah ha uh, has these visions of dead bodies stacked up throughout the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, dogs and birds are, are eating on the dead corpses. Uh, and Jeremiah is having this vision that God has given him. And as he sees this vision, it was not a good experience for him. He speaks here uh, of his wound of his, and his grief. Notice it says this is a grief. What, what God had called this guy to was a very difficult situation. Imagine seeing these visions for some 40 years, preaching to the group of hard-hearted people. Not one person is converted. How big of a grief must that have been to serve God for 40 years um, and not see any changes in any one single person's life? But notice what he says here. But I must endure. I must bear it. Uh, his teach. Uh, this teaches us something uh, for today. God calls you and me to do difficult tasks in our life, the tough ministries in our culture. God does not just call us for fun and games of life. And when we run into a tough ministry, oftentimes we label that Satan is doing something. You know, faithfulness to God's calling over a long period of time can sometimes be grievous. Sometimes ministry can be tough and sometimes ministry can be lonely. But thanks, thanks to God, Jeremiah is saying here, I must endure. Sometimes God is is going to call you and me into a difficult ministry and the response which God is looking for uh, you to answer is the same response which Jeremiah is giving and that is I must endure it doesn't matter how much I don't like it it doesn't matter how much I am discomforted with uh, this personally this is what God has called me to and therefore I'm going to be faithful uh, when things go wrong we are always looking for someone to get the blame. And so let's take a look now at, uh, at, at that. So uh, press pause, read verses 20 and 21, and then press play once again. All right, here again, we see the word senseless used, the word stupid, essentially. And so both the religious and the political leaders are being blamed. They have become stupid. And when a government becomes stupid, they... Can real, there can really be a problem for the people. And so here we have governmental leaders and religious leaders who have become stupid. Notice that the, store, the source of their stupidity is that they no longer seek God. Wisdom finds its way when you have a fear of the Lord, a reverence for God, a respect for God. But when I forget God, I can become stupid in a hurry. 
And when that happens, all of our spiritual prosperity goes out the window. Now, Jeremiah has an interesting response. Uh, press pause and read verses 22 and 23, and then press play again. It is likely that it will take each of us the majority of our lives to fully understand verse 23. When we were young, we had a tendency to think that we have all the answers. I have life wired. I understand how things work. I'm the master of my own destiny. I choose to go this way or that way. Well, after you've crashed and burned on several occasions, and along with the benefits of aging and maturing, uh, the more you comprehend how much you don't understand, and you and 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 the more you realize uh, that you, you have fewer answers, and pretty soon you find yourself standing before God, as Jeremiah is standing before God here in this verse, and he's saying, "Look, God, I really don't know. It's not within me. I don't have the capacity to direct my own life. Uh, I don't have the capability to direct other people's lives." It's not within me, so God, I need your help. So then, <clears throat> here's a prayer of Jeremiah. Press pause and read verses 24 and 25, then press play once again. Jeremiah was told earlier, do not pray for these people in Israel. But God never told Jeremiah, you can't pray for yourself. And so Jeremiah is praying for himself. Notice, leading up to... Jeremiah is breathing out fire to Israel by saying, you have missed it here, Jerusalem. God is going to do this and God is going to do that and bodies are going to be brought out of their graves and all of this is going to be a horrible thing. Now, uh, as Christians, isn't it easy for us to speak out about our culture? It's easy for us to speak out about our government. But what Jeremiah is doing here. He is saying not only does Jerusalem have a problem, but notice uh, not only Judah has a problem, he's saying, I, I have a problem. I, Jeremiah, have a problem. Understand that this is the most righteous man in the entire country. This is the only guy Israel in Israel who is right with God. And yet notice that he is honest enough to say, hey, there's something wrong with me. I need to be fixed. And yet, even though Jeremiah is a righteous man, he's not a perfect man. He knows that he's, he's not a sinless man. And so he's saying, God, not only do I need your help directing my life, I need your help to become pure. I need your help to become the man that I am supposed to be. And so uh, this now ends his sermon which began in the, the gate of the temple. Now, we don't know how much time elapses between chapters uh, 10 and 11. One of the difficult things about studying Jeremiah is that it's not written uh, in a chronological order. It appears that this book is laid out in sermons and visions, um, uh, which God has given to Jeremiah. So keep that in mind that Something that we read early in Jeremiah does not necessarily mean it happened earlier in his life. And in like fashion, don't think that something you read toward the end of the book of Jeremiah is something which happened later on in Jeremiah's life. It's not written in chronological order. And so we don't know how much time has passed between chapters 10 and 11. But no doubt, God uh, gave Israel some time to... Uh, to process, to chew on the sermon for a while. And when some time has passed and there's been no repentance, there's been no turning around, Jeremiah is now commissioned uh, for another message to uh, Israel. So we're in chapter 11 now. And so read verses uh, 1 through 4 and then press play again. Now you remember that when Joshua brought Israel into the promised land, one of the first things which he did, other than fighting with the Canaanites, was to lead them into the valley of Shechem. Uh, and what a scene that must have been. You had Joshua and the priesthood down in the valley, and then half the people of Israel, and remember there were millions of them, half of them went up to the top of Mount Gerizim, and the other half of the people went up onto Mount Ebal. Uh, and uh, there... You would have Joshua and the priesthood rehearsing the entire covenant, which 
uh, with the nation of Israel. So Joshua and the priests would be in the valley between these two mountains, and they would essentially be taking Jeremiah, uh, De Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28, uh, the blessings and the curses, and one by one they would recite each blessing and recite each cur curse, and then the nation of Israel at the top of these two mountains would cry out, Amen, after that recitation of each of the blessings and each of the curses, and essentially that was their uh, confirmation or signing, if you will, of accepting the covenant. And God was saying, you know, you want to be my people, you want to be, you want me to be your God. All right, this is the deal. I will do this if you will do that. Isn't that what we do in contracts? We sit uh, down at the bargaining table and say, well, if I'm going to do this, then you're going to do that. And we agree upon something and we affirm it by signing. Uh, you know, and then we have a contract or a covenant. And if someone does not keep up their end of the contract, what is your response to that? Well, when one of the parties does not perform in the contract, then that gives the other party the right to walk away from their obligation in the agreement. And this is what God is saying to the nation of Israel. We had a contract. Remember the Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal a deal dating all the way back to Joshua. I kept my side of the deal. This would be essentially what God is saying to Israel. I kept my side of the deal and you did not. So the time is drawing near where I'm going to walk away from my side of the agreement. All right, press pause now and read verses 5 through 11. 5 through 11, then press play again. <clears throat> and so God is saying, that these people are going to be praying, they are going to be crying unto me, but I am not going to be listening to any of that. Now, in a relationship, when you have constant cheating on the part of one of the parties, let's say one person decides to step out, step out of the relationship and have an affair, we know that sometimes God gives uh, his grace and, and, uh, and the offended receives the offender back into the relationship, there's restoration, there's forgiveness, and the marriage moves forward. All is forgotten, and some time passes, and that party might step out again, and it is likely that, and we know couples that this has happened with more than one time, and we have seen the grace and the mercy of God in that relationship uh, for restoration. Yet there comes a point, regardless of how gracious, and regardless of how forgiving that the offended party can be, there does come a point where that person says, I'm finished, I'm done. You are a serial adulterer and I have no intent, you have no intent on changing. And so we're finished. And so that's what God is saying to Israel in these verses. He's saying, you have stepped out on me so many times. I have, I've come to your aid. I've come to your rescue and now I'm done. No more. And so you can complain and cry all you want. I'm not going to be answering your prayers. And you can look forward to a Holocaust coming your way. All right. Uh, press pause and read verses 12 uh, through 14 and then press play again. And so God gives us some insight here. How many cities do you think there were in Judah? There were hundreds of cities. And... Uh, how many gods do you think that they were worshiping in these cities? Well, there were hundreds of them. And how many street corners do you think there were just in the city of Jerusalem? Well, likely there were thousands of street corners. And that is how many false altars they had set up. This was known as the city of God, the city where the temple was located. And these were the, these people were the apple of God's eyes. And these people were allowing thousands of false altars to worship idols on every street corner all over the city. And, uh, and not only were they doing that, they were doing it out in the public. They weren't even keeping it a secret. They were just parading around and they were worshiping false idols. So imagine what kind of passion verse 13 might have been spoken with by God. You know, if you were married and you found out that your spouse had a hundred had hundreds of affairs, what kind of emotion, what kind of passion might you speak similar words to that unfaithful uh, spouse? Um, and so, um, um, you can, uh, God is saying, to, telling them, you can cry out all you want, but I'm not going to listen. All right, so now let's take a look 
this all becomes very personal now to Jeremiah. So press pause and read verses 15 through 20, and then press play again. All right, it is likely that this took place later in Jeremiah's ministry, likely that he that this happened 30 plus years into his ministry. We really don't know, but leading up to this, uh, he is known as the weeping prophet, or you know, he is crying, oh my gosh, oh my pain, I can't believe what what is going to happen to Israel. It breaks my heart to see this city, which I love being destroyed. And God must have told Jeremiah, hey, do you know that these guys are planning your death? They're planning to kill you. And he is likely responding, what? You know, I'm a good guy. I, I haven't done anything wrong. And when you have this kind of perspective being changed, you can be thinking, don't save them, God. Go kill them. You know, protect me. And that is exactly what happened here. Jeremiah gets enlightened by God and realizes that these people are planning to kill him. The very same people who he's been crying over, the very same people who he's been wrestling with God regarding the judgment to come. And once Jeremiah figures out that these people are out to kill him, he is resolved. I'm done crying for these people. And his prayers to God change from saving them to destroying them. I notice now who the culprits are. Very interesting. Press pause and read verses 21 through 23, and then press play again. All right, now, what was Anatoth? Uh, we studied earlier in Jeremiah, at the very beginning of this study, that Anatoth was Jeremiah's hometown. This is where he was from. This was one of the Levitical cities which God had established for the priests to live in. And so Jeremiah, coming from a priestly line, was living in a priestly city. And so isn't it interesting that here you have priests and they, those priests, are planning the death of an innocent man. And no doubt this is a foreshadowing or a precursor of what would eventually happen to another righteous man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the priesthood who planned the death of Jesus Christ. Now, notice they were saying to Jeremiah, we want you to shut your mouth. And isn't it interesting that those who fight God, the very same people who want to take away the freedom of speech, they don't want to debate issues, they don't want to discuss logical issues, they just want you to shut your mouth. They are uh, not interested in hearing anything. Why? Because they're not interested in changing their lifestyle. And so Jeremiah is quite the interesting guy. He's He's a faithful man. He's a man who hangs tough for some 40 years in this ministry. And what is also interesting about him is not only does he recognize that he is not a perfect guy, how difficult would it have been for any of us living in a nation where the only one, uh, where, where you were the only one who knows God? Uh, what might that have been like? You know, Jeremiah was the only one in Jerusalem that was right with God. And yet being in such an environment where he could have built himself up to be really something special, uh, he humbly went before God and said, no, there's something wrong with me. I need your help, God. Please don't destroy them. Please change my life. Now, in our next study, <clears throat> uh, we will get to chapter 12. Uh, we'll get into chapter 12, and we're going to see Jeremiah does not have all the answers. Jeremiah will get into this whole idea of the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, why, why do the wicked prosper? Why does God allow the wicked to prosper? And Jeremiah is not attacking God. He's just challenging God uh, um, uh, by, by trying to find out God's perspective. He's just going to God and saying, I don't understand. And we all understand that it's like a child or a grandchild coming up to us and challenging us. Uh, we And we also know it is likely that they really just don't know and that, that I'm not here to attack you. I'm just here for wisdom. I'm here for insight. And this is the approach which Jeremiah will take in chapter 12. And the great lesson we can take away from this uh, is that we adopt the same attitude that Jeremiah used uh, when approaching God. God, please help me understand. 
I need your insight. I need your wisdom. And God will certainly give you the insight and the wisdom which you need. Amen. Okay, I hope this has been helpful and informative. And thank you for viewing. Our next study will be Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13. Thank you and good day.